Hi, good morning, good afternoon, and well, also probably good evening in some areas of the world. Um, I'm here today to talk to you about uh, the Lord and Savior from an Ansible modules. I bet you've heard me rambling about them already a few times, but if you hadn't, uh, this is really the best thing since sliced bread. And today I will try to show you a few examples how you as any member of the community can contribute to making those modules even better and integrating them with your workflows that are maybe not supported yet because things might be not ready. Um, so what are Form and Ansible modules anyways? Um, those are modules for Ansible, obviously, that interact with Foreman and plugins, mainly Catello, but we also have support for OpenSCAP, the SCC manager, the snapshot plugin, remote execution, and not, nothing yet for Ansible. So we cannot use Ansible to manage form and to manage Ansible yet. But Marek wanted to work on this. Um, so um, the modules also, so it's, it's a collection, so you can install it on your machine. It also hosts the inventory and callback plugin. So if you ever need Ansible to run against the machines in you that are defined by Foreman. It's also what you can use here. But my, my focus today will be the modules that talk to Foreman to manage Foreman. Um, <clears throat> the collection is available from Gal Ansible Galaxy as any other collection. You can install it today using Ansible Galaxy CLI. And we also provide an RPM, so, cast uh, so users that uh, probably cannot reach out to, to the Galaxy because they're in a closed environment or do not want to reach out to Galaxy for some reason, can just go and yum install. Um, the result will be the very same. You will end up having the modules on your disk and your Ansible will pick them up and you can use them. Uh, development happens on GitHub as with everything else in Foreman land, it's uh, github.com slash the Foreman slash Foreman Ansible modules. There is also, obviously, given that we are Red Hat and we need to make money, um, there is also a satellite Ansible collection. Um, it's essentially the same. It's, more, it's based on the upstream Foreman Ansible modules, or also called PAM, by the way. Um, but it's designed to interact with satellite and set of format. Um, by design, um, it means we brand the collection to, to be called satellite and set of format, and we drop a few plugins that are not part of satellite. That's the only difference, right? Um, for customers of satellite, if you're on 6.7 or newer, you can just install it from Automation Hub, which is the supported and um, what, what's it called? So yeah, it's a supported version or the uh, source for collections. Um, and you on 6.8, you can also have the same thing as an upstream. You can yum install it if you do not want to reach out to Automation Hub. From now on, I will mostly, or rather, only refer to the Foreman side, but um, anything that I will say about the Foreman collection also uh, applies to the satellite collection because code-wise, they are the same. As I said, it's only branding and unsupported modules that are removed. Um, there is a GitHub repository for the satellite collection, but um, we're essentially only using it for um, like having the code hosted somewhere. Um, we do not accept issues or PRs there. Um, if you have any issue with the satellite collection, please um, go the uh, normal support route or via a Red Hat case or a Red Hat, a Red Hat Bugzilla. As soon as this happens, we will um, usually sync things up to upstream to, to the GitHub issues and then from there go and fix things or help you. Um, and the goal, as usual, is to rebase on upstream as often as possible. So 
we try not to diverge of the downstream um, collection. So if there is an upstream 1.4, there will also be a downstream 1.4, and we try not to have a dot Z which uh, with, with a very high number. So far, it worked out. We'll see how that come, uh, will, will be in the future. But today, it's not about um, how we brand things. It's how you can contribute. And um, well, I wish you all would contribute because at the moment, we are rather understaffed on the, uh, on the module side. It's usually Eric, Matthias, and me who do things. And um, well, we cannot get everything done. So if you are a developer for Foreman for Catalo and you have a few cycles left or you're implementing something in the API, this talk is for you. Obviously, please do everything upstream first, um, get it on GitHub, and we will make sure that also our customers will benefit from it. So what or how can you as a I'd say random bystander or random user can help us. Well, number one is documentation. We have documentation around the modules, which is um, mostly around which parameters you need to enter. But from the support cases I've seen in Red Hat and also from the support issues opened on GitHub, there is a just that people are not always understanding what they need to do, which I think is because a lot of our documentation is copy pasted from the Foreman API documentation, which is very developer oriented. So for example, sometimes it will just say, enter operating system title. What a title is, nobody knows. And I will show you an example how we can improve it later. <coughs> I'm sorry. So whenever you need to read documentation, you can do this online on the foreman github.io slash foreman ansible modules or using ansible doc, the foreman foreman, and the module tag. The documentation is generated from the module source code. So there is no special file that would contain only documentation. For any module, it's, it's part of the module itself. And a few common things are extracted as documentation fragments. Those are super useful because, for example, we have uh, documentation how to connect to a foreman slash satellite. And obviously, it's the same for every single module because all of them connect to the API. You'd get mad to have that as a copy in every file. So there is a fragment for doing this in the doc fragments folder and get included in every module. This is super handy and allows us also to propagate fixes much quicker because you don't have to edit 50 files. And 50 is about the number of modules we have today. So. And sometimes the fixes that are required are really, really simple and maybe even stupid a bit, like the PR I did, I think, last Sunday, because Marek pointed out that the, ex the example for the status info module actually says foreman status, not foreman status info. It seems silly that such a small change is required, but if you're the user, and you're looking at the documentation and there is an example. You copy paste it and you run it and it doesn't work. It's super frustrating. And on the one hand, you might be even um, like discouraged to further use the project because like if they can't get the basics, the basic documentation correct. Why would I trust them to have more complicated cases, right? Um, so this is something that anybody could have done. Um, Marek founded it. He opened an issue. He, at the same time, he could have opened 
the PR directly. It doesn't matter. The real point is it got fixed. Um, so anytime you find something like this, please, please tell us. Another, another thing that we fixed a while ago is we have one single module that is not talking to Foreman, but it's talking to the Red Hat portal. It's designed to download a manifest from the portal, so it can be in the later step uploaded to Catello. Well, someone, probably this guy, had edited a lot of files uh, in a semi-automated way and updated the description of the username fields to be username on format server. Well, yeah, but this module, it's not the format server. So we had to fix it at some point. Again, super simple change for a string, but might be quite confusing for a user because uh, they would enter different username password there if they read the, the wrong string and end up with a non-working module. <clears throat> But sometimes it's also um, even worse. It's not a wrong string, but wrong from formatting. Like this is a note from the um, template sync module that we have, and it's documenting a bug in the module uh, in the plugin. But it's completely the the note itself is completely broken in, in the in the online view. And the right way to, to format it would be like this. So it's it's nicely highlighted, and you have a bullet point list with the two points that the node want, want you to know. This is something that um, was fixed at some point, because a user noticed that the rendering is wrong. The fix was trivial. The fix was uh, to remove a single pipe to make um, YAML not render the, the, the paragraph as a full string, but have it, um, have it as an, what is it, an array, I think. A simple change, but very powerful to make documentation better visible to the user. And now to the example I mentioned earlier. What the heck is an operating system title? We refer to operating systems in multiple modules, but operating systems are a bit weird in Foreman. They have three, um, um, three properties that are combined to a title. They have a name, like a CentOS or Debian, and they have a major and minor version. And I think major version is even required. Um, I'm not totally sure. But for usability reasons, if you search, we implemented the search in the modules in a way that you can search for Debian without the versions, and it would find the right, the right operating system if you only have one Debian. But if you have like Debian 9, Debian 10, you need to provide a unique string here. But our documentation just said operating system title. And all the users were like, but it's throwing me a completely non-understandable error here. It's telling me it found too many operating systems. And um, at some point, we realized, yes, operating system title is something totally obvious for a developer because he knows how the title is generated in Foreman, but the user has no idea. And this is something that we improved at some point. And I'm pretty sure we have many more places that describe parameters with a very brief one, two words. And it's obvious to, to developers who know how things operate, but the user will be just confused. So please, if you find something like this, um, raise a PR, raise an issue, and let us make the whole documentation better. So um, how can we improve? Um, please just use the modules and use the documentation for them. And every time you cannot 
just open the documentation and either copy paste the example or even find the right module that you need, this is an issue with our documentation. Tell us, please. We don't know because we are too, um, too blind in, in this regard. Um, I think I've read an RC a, a discussion like Monday. A user wanted to enable Red Hat repositories, and it wasn't obvious for them that they need to use the repository set module. Repository sets are the internal name in Catello, how Red Hat repositories are named, but it's not nothing that the user would know. So if the documentation of the module is going saying manage uh, repository sets, the user will never ever know that it's about Red Hat repositories, which are handled different like uh, compared to custom repositories. Well, this is, by the way, something that we still need to fix. It's still saying manage repository sets, which is nonsense. Um, so yeah. Every time you find an issue, please tell us, or please provide uh, examples, please provide uh, suggestions how we could improve. The next step is slightly more developer-oriented, not user-oriented, but um, also users will find this. It's missing parameters. Um, the way Ansible works and also the way the Ansible modules are implemented is we need to have a more or less static list of parameters the module accepts. So whenever the API changes, and by changes, I mean accepts a new parameter, an optional one probably, we need to know. If we don't, we we cannot we will not expose this parameter to the user, and the user will not be able to manage this aspect of your API. So, I think ideally, whenever you as the developer are touching an API and implementing a feature that extends the API. It would be super cool if you would open up an issue or a PR against the modules. I think probably quite similar to what you do in Hammer, because Hammer needs, uh, at least I think, I think Hammer needs similar um, input from, from developers. And um, I'll show you how simple those extensions are on the next slides. And I need to cut a bit of coffee, I'm sorry. So example here is uh, the activation key module. And for some reason, the reason here was, I think nobody who implemented activation keys originally needed a description. But nevertheless, activation keys can have a description. So at some point, we, we added this to the module. And it was, uh, what is it? Five line change from what uh, one line is actual code and the other lines are documentation. So the, the first four lines, um, this is Ansible documentation forward that you see here. It's saying description, that's the parameter name, then description, it's a description of the description, rather confusing, and gets like a string. Here again, the string isn't too nice. It's a description of the activation key, but it's I think it's pro, uh, pre pretty telling itself. And you have to define it, the type as a string. And then um, down below in the real code, you just add a description to the form and spec, which is uh, our extension to the Ansible spec, and that's all. Um, by that, you have declared a new field. And if that's a simple string field that needs no references, like to a different um, resource or anything, you're done. Um, everything else will be handled by the abstraction layer we have implemented. So you just tell um, there is a new field, use it. Um, another example would be not adding a field, but extending the possible choices of a field. 
Uh, this is, um, you see it's, it's in the doc fragment and in the module util, so it's, uh, it's code that you shared between multiple uh, modules. It's about PXE loaders. And for some reason, we forgot to include the non-loader, which is saying don't do PXE. Um, again, the change is rather simple. You add non to the list of in the documentation, and you'll add none to the list of choices that Ansible accepts, and you're done. Two line change, and another user was happy. Basically, the same thing in the provisioning template module, where uh, we have forgotten to add certain template types. Um, the history of this is, is rather funny. Uh, when we originally implemented the module, we had all the possible uh, template types from a uh, naked formant, so plain formant. Then at some point, somebody said, but I cannot create job templates, te templates which um, is an extension from the remote execution plugin. And then somebody said, but we are also missing boot disk. And then we realized, yeah, sure. Um, let's check like with all the plugins and so And then we realized that we were missing cloud in it and kernel exec too. So it always helps to, to have a foreman with all the plugins installed to verify or provide the list uh, of possible entries. And before you ask, yes, it's useful to limit the choices here because otherwise the user doesn't see this list in the documentation and will need to find out the names uh, on a different way. And I think that's rather complicated when you don't know your ways around the API. And the last example, I think, yeah, last example is from the subnet module. So, uh, we recently uh, got uh, support for external IPM in Foreman. And to support that in, in subnet module, we again had to add um, external IPM to the IPM choices. And um, as you can select an IPAM proxy, the, way, the same way as you can a DNS proxy, uh, we had to add that too. And here is here a slightly more complicated example of code. Um, we define a parameter called external, pro uh, external IPAM proxy, and it's referring an, an entity, a smart proxy entity, and we're saying that the API expects that to be stored as the external IPAM ID field. Um, this is documented on our development documentation. So if you ever will need to do this, have a look there. Um, as soon as you've done it, like once you will know your ways around. So to summarize how we can improve on the API part, um, when you are implementing the, uh, a feature, please ensure that the fields that are exposed in the API doc, because that's something very important. We use API doc. If it's not in the API doc, we cannot use it. And the same also applies to the show action. We've seen a few cases where um, you could edit something in the UI, but when you would go and do show on the API, this information would not be included. And ideally, if you have the time, please uh, tell us or even open APR against from Ansible modules to implement that. The last thing that I want to show you is uh, like the latest or the biggest chunk that we might need improvement. But it's, it won't fit on a single slide like the examples before. It does fit in a single blog post. So uh, the blog post is linked, and there are also links at the end of the presentation, which I am sure Melanie will share with everybody afterwards 
uh, for reading, how can we quickly implement a module? My timer says that I'm still, I have like five minutes left, so I will be rather quick here so we can do some, some questions. So um, every module that you will do uh, will always start with an import from the formal helper. That's our um, internal abstraction layer for the formal API. And given that HTTP proxies, which is what I'm showing you here, are taxonomic, so they can belong to an organization and a location, we are importing the Foreman taxonomic entity uh, template. There are different documentations available if you need to know which what, what differences are. Um, and then we define a class called Foreman HTTP proxy module. It inherits the taxonomic thing, and it's otherwise an empty class. It's empty because everything else uh, is done later. And we just need the custom name so that our abstraction layer knows which API to talk to. What do we need to do more? We need to define the form aspect so the parameters shown to the user on the Ansible command line but also at the same time that are passed to the Foreman API. Uh, for an HTTP proxy, this is rather simple. A proxy always has a name. It also always has an URL. And it has a username and a password. Given that username and password parameters are already used in our modules for the API interaction, we are calling the parameters for the module proxy username and proxy password and rename them. Again, this is documented if you want to know how exactly flat, flat name works. And we never lock passwords. That would be bad. That's all. Uh, we now just need to say, look, go make an API connection and run the module. For a simple entity as an HTTP proxy that can just be created, updated, and deleted, this is all we need. Um, there is essentially no, no further code needed. If you go to the blog post I mentioned, you will see that um, you can add more code to, be, to add more user experience to it, but it's not strictly necessary. <coughs> I'm sorry. So, what else can we do? Like, what besides writing code for the Ansible modules um, and fixing documentation for the modules? What can we do, or what can you do, um, especially as developers of Foreman and Catello? Um, I would like to ask you to fix my bug. Uh, there is a tracker uh, that's called API bugs that need to work around in Foreman and Ansible modules, and it's currently counting twenty-five attached issues out of which 15 are still new. Um, most of them are around API docs not being up to date or um, requests not answering useful information. Um, this makes the maintenance of the modules harder. We, need, we carry uh, API doc patches for many of those issues. But um, yeah, you know, if, if we wouldn't have to carry around patches, that would be great. So if you have the time and um, willingness to dive into code, there are a lot of fruits hanging there. Not all of them are too low, honestly. So yeah, um, I promise, promise some links to go. Please contribute uh, to the modules. Um, there is documentation. Uh, there is my blog post, how to write for an Ansible module in 20 minutes, uh, 20 lines of code. Uh, it's really just 20 lines of them, plus I think like 20 documentation lines. Um, and a bit of documentation for Ansible, document, uh, Ansible module format, like how you format the module itself and the documentation stands up. And obviously the API bugs that I mentioned earlier. <sighs>
29 minutes, 55 seconds. I'm done. Thank you very much. And I hope you have a lot of questions for me. And Melanie won't kill me for getting too long here. Thank you, Evgeny. Um, are there, I don't see any questions in the chat or the Q&A. So the, are there any, is there anyone that would like to ask a question? Uh, sure, uh, I've got a question to uh, start us off. Uh, thanks, Evgeny. Um, would you mind going back to the slide with the uh, taxonomic entity? Um, I have some questions about, yes, exactly. So um, you said that the, the taxonomic entities, hopefully I'm saying that right, uh, are entities which are related to uh, organizations and locations. Um, so would the organizations, locations that that entity is connected to be part of the foreman spec that's defined when instantiating your module class, uh, or is, is that defined in another way? So um, the foreman taxonomic entity module is a base class that we're inheriting from, and that defines um, organizations and locations as parameters. So every class that inherits from it automatically gets it, so you don't have to redefine it. And the taxonomic entity again inherits from a normal entity module, which then defines like server URL, username, password, and so on. So those organizations and locations wouldn't be part of the form and spec parameter, they would be Separate parameters will already part of the form and spec, but of the parent module, the parent class. Okay. So okay. You don't gotcha. have to care about it at all. Gotcha. As soon as you know your entity is taxonomic, you say it's a taxonomic entity, and our helpers do the magic for you. Marek did a poll. He did a poll to see how many people had already tried the form and ansible collection. And the the majority of six of the respondents have actually uh, tried it already. That's awesome. Anyone else? Any? Comments, questions? I'd say it's because of getting your, your constant blogging and um, appearances on the, the demo has has a lot of this quite clear and the information is, is out there, which is, you know, fantastic. And um, you know, everything, everything is, um, is quite apparent. I have one one small thing with the Ansible, with the modules, with the collection. Is the default the auto-generated docs? Is that is that Sphinx? Is that why you chose that, or is was it was it a choice? I suppose it wasn't a choice. It's how Ansible generates their documentation, and uh, we are essentially just inheriting their tools. And um, I didn't want to write another thing myself um, to get those things done. No, but I, I understand that that's completely reasonable. There's enough to do. Um, I was always curious about that um, because a lot of projects are using it, but that makes perfect sense. So if you want to read the details, I blogged about that too. Um, but uh, the gist is there is a tool for, from the Endable community to build documentation for, for modules, be it in a collection or outside of it, and we are using it. And right now, we essentially publish the documentation on every commit to the branch or on every tag. There is a GitHub action that uh, builds the documentation and publishes on GitHub pages. Uh, the, the interesting part would be then with you and me and Sergey including that in a nice way in our official documentation or documentation NG or how you call it, I don't know. 
yeah, the, yeah, NG for seems to uh, LZAP gave it that name, and it seems to have stuck for now. It gets repeated enough that it's become its title. And no, the the PR I was working on got merged this morning, so yeah, let's meet, and we'll see how we can make them a little bit better. Cool. And if we have two minutes technically left, is there anything else? I'll just also paste a link to breakout session. If anybody is interested in following up with more questions, more discussions, you're free to do so. What if, so thank you, Evgeny. Thank you very much for very uh, interesting talk. <clears throat> I will, so if anybody is watching this recording, um, you can ask questions on the form and discourse at any time and we'd be happy to hear from you. And